Hello, this is Miles Richardson, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Oh, yes, quite so. Yes, of course, I do know the medium. G'day audiophiles, you are listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio media. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Philip. <laughs> G'day Philip. G'day everyone. How are you? How's things going? Ah, uh, things are going fine. I've got no life at the moment. We're locked down. We can go out one hour a day for exercise. There's a curfew on. We uh, forgot the curfew yesterday because one of my daughters who lives somewhere else came round and at 20 to 7 we realised we couldn't get her home again back in time for curfew. So she stayed the night. Yeah. So anyhow. Isn't it interesting how 12 months ago we were feeling sorry for our English fa- uh, English friends who are under that very extended lockdown and now how the tables have turned. Yeah, it's a bit painful and yeah, but yeah, it's more important than staying healthy. Unfortunately, yeah, we hit a thousand, unfortunately a thousand cases today in New South Wales which is a new high, so it, it's not going to be over for a while yet. In some parts of the world, they'll be saying, yeah, so? <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's bad for us. Yeah, it is It is the worst we've seen uh, in this country. So we've got a good show coming up for today. We're going to be having a very special chat with um, Jason Hay Gallery, the man behind Big Finish. Looking forward to that one? I am indeed. I've met Jason a couple of times, so I'm looking forward to chatting with him and you know, being able to get him to share the story of Big Finish. We, we, we did Gary a while ago. It's going to be interesting hearing a different perspective. And we saw Jason on Whovians. Was it last year or the year before last? He was in Australia and he, and he made a guest appearance on Whovians. Did you see that episode? I did. For, for our non-Australian listeners, just so you know, we have a, a show that appears after Doctor Who called Whovians. It's hosted by one of our um, fairly famous talk show hosts, out here, he's a big Doctor Who fan, and I, I can't think of his name for the life of me. Rove, Rove McManus. Rove McManus, thank you. Jason Hay Gallery happened to be out for one episode, and so they had him on the panel. Before we get to that, I think I see something up ahead. Do you know what it is, Philip? Oh, I, I hope bet it's you can't it is. guess. Actually, oh, no. no, I think you can. It's a rabbit hole. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so, Philip, we're in the rabbit hole, and since we're going to be talking to the the sort of the the nuts and bolts guy of Big Finish, he's coming up shortly, got me thinking about some of the criticisms that I see online of some people uh, when they talk about Big Finish being um, too too extensive with uh, their ranges of spin-offs and things like that. a lot of people seem to have the idea that it's a bit of Doctor Who overload. And I'm curious to know what your opinion is about whether we have too much stuff in the world of Big Finish. Is is enough enough? Is there too much to keep up with now? Or uh, can we pick and choose? Or as fans, are we too uh, too much of, of a completist uh, as individual fans to be able to, to, to cope with something like Big Finish with so many different ranges to choose from? What do you think? I think that's a great question. I think yes, 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 and yes, uh, and no. Uh, can you ever have enough Doctor Who? No. So I actually don't think you can ever have too much Big Finish or too much Doctor Who when the stuff they're producing is so good. So that's yeah, that, that for me is not an issue. Is it hard for people in terms of being able to keep up? Yes. Especially if you're new. Especially if you're new in terms of just trying to catch on. And... Can I say, people have a, you know, those of you who are new to Big Finish, you have a joy because you have years of good material to keep going through. And, you know, one day when the worst comes to worse and, you know, should Big Finish ever close down, which I guess it will one day, uh, there's still going to be so much material out there to be able to be enjoyed for years. And generally speaking, it just doesn't date. So that's one of the great joys of Big Finish. But it is overwhelming because there's so much stuff. It is expensive because there's so much stuff. And so you have to make choices. 
Big Finish does help out with lots of sales. And so if you're patient enough, things will come ab- come around at some stage down the track cheap. And you know, certainly the first you know, monthly range, I think the whole first hundred at least, maybe it's more than that now, is very, very cheap to buy and still brilliant stories. And the there. first 50 are still free. And there's many of the Eighth Doctor and Lucy Adventures too and other spin-offs that are on Spotify for free too, if you go looking. There you go. And then the only problem is if you're a completist, you have to have it. Yes. <laughs> so, so part of my issue is being a completist. But that being said, I used to have to have all the CDs and I managed to get myself over that because it, it just happened that, you know, with the, the free downloads, I've, I have moved to the download world now. Yeah. So I, I have many cases. And so at some stage, I'm thinking about maybe selling off my CDs. Uh, but no, maybe really? not. No, I'm probably not. I'm probably Ooh. lying. <laughs> but I, I was actually going through my, my shed uh, looking for... Uh, a specific book the other day so there you go all my books are out in the shed now and i i I discovered so many target novels and bbc books and even a few i don't have too many virgin new adventures but i lots and lots of bbc uh pdas and um edas and i I couldn't believe how how much stuff i had and i thought oh should i sell this and i thought about it for like a fraction of a second went i don't think i can I can right now so yeah it's the same with uh with dvds and cds people are starting with the blu-rays to come out uh with the blu-rays coming out now they're starting to say uh that uh, they're going to sell off their dvd collections so people are starting to do that now um and i haven't quite got to that point yet i can't I, i've got a space for them and they'll just sit there for a little while <laughs> I, did, I did sell off my whole vhs collection when the dvds came yep and you know what? I think I regret it now. I think I actually would still like to have those VHS because they meant so much to me at the time and took so many years to collect and cost so much money. But I did actually get rid of the VHSs for the DVDs, but I'm not going, I'm not going Blu-ray yet because I don't have a Blu-ray player. Yeah. Uh, I just picked up my uh, season 24 just came out the week that we're recording this, so... In Australia, so I was able to pick that up. Got some. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm working on the extended versions of season 24 because they've got extra bits. Uh, so there's a disc with the normal TV version. There's a disc with the extended version on it too. So that's that's uh, fascinating stuff. But in terms of Big Finish and the criticism it gets for the amount of ranges that they have and keep on trying to and, and not trying to, but they keep on releasing. I tend to find myself questioning whether those people who are being critical have actually listened to them in the first place Um, because I suspect that uh, they have either not listened to them or they're not generally fans of audio in the first place because the audio medium medium is uh, is is not as easy as flicking on the tv you've got to put a bit more effort into it than doing that it's 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 not quite on the same level as sitting there and listening to an audio book for 10 hours, but it's, uh, it's sort of in between. So you do have to put a bit more concentration into it. And if you're not willing to do that, or if you've tried it and you expect it to give you an experience, just like a television sit flopping yourself down in front of the TV is going to do, you're going to be disappointed. And you might, you might find yourself being a bit critical because fans like to grab onto negative things and, uh, and go down negative um, paths. So I, I think uh, I see the criticisms and I must say I don't agree with them uh, when it comes to uh, the amount of big finish stuff that's out there. Because if there's something you don't like, you just don't buy it. And if it's something that doesn't sell for big finish, well, you're not going to get too many more uh, new releases from that particular range. They'll close it down. But many of the ranges go on to series one, two, three. What do we, what do we just have the War Master series six was it just came out we had the third doctor adventures series seven series we've got, we've got more unit coming out soon so yeah we're up to eight or nine for that yeah river song is huge numbers as well i mean um jago, jago and life got, got to 14 and we're still going and so, we're still going if it weren't for the death of an actor yeah and the thing is as i said if if these things weren't selling they wouldn't make them because unlike the BBC, for instance, who are making a TV show to try and appeal to a mass audience, the B- the Big Finish has to appeal to an audience who will stick their hand in their pocket and part with cash 
which uh, a general TV viewing audience doesn't have to do. So I think Big Finish has a, a harder job in retaining their audience, actually. And the fact that they're still there and still doing it decades later after they began uh, is a testament to the quality of their stories. So um, that's what I've got to say about that, Philip. And I agree with you, Dwayne. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. So you should. <laughs> Let's get out of the rabbit hole. We'll uh, we'll throw in uh, we'll throw in a trailer for something that's uh, recent or current, and then we'll be back in a moment with Jason Hay Gallery from Big Finish Productions, The Third Doctor, Volume Eight: Conspiracy in Space. Could it be city stardust jamming with the spiders on Mars? Don't be absurd, Joe. <laughs> Dare you place a claw on the hilt of your sword? I am the Lady Zin, Dowager of the Jade Chordata. As a matter of fact, I know exactly where we are. Well, it's not the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, is it? An Earth female? She may be diseased. Draconian guards? Doctor, we're on Draconia. That would seem to be the obvious conclusion. <laughs> and may the words choke in my windpipe like a half-digested mammalian. Three... Two, one, and chokes away! Eyes must intercept and kill. The young emperor is not beholden to anything said in haste. To place, place myself, myself henceforth, henceforth on his draconian, draconian majesty's, majesty's secret, secret service. service. Aren't you a little short for draconian? I think they're going to ram us. Look out! Intercept and kill. Hey! <laughs> Devil's Hoof Prints. I've waited such a long time for this. Doctor, come out and look. Ah, interesting. <gasps> what was that? Relax. Mr. Chilton, we're ready. Yes, good. Submerge the superconductor coils and activate circuits one through four. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works! Oh, if the famous ghost doesn't get you, it looks like a nice spot for a picnic. He's meant to be a sprite or spirit that haunts the tour, and he's only ever seen in the coldest winters. Doctor! Miss Smith! Over here! Ah, there he is. Why has Unit been called in? This isn't a holiday, Doctor. Yes, well, it couldn't be helped, old chap. Doctor! Get down! Fire at will! For pity's sake, man! Reverse the polarity before it's too late. You'll find I'm in charge here, Doctor. Chilton must be insane. Have we ever met? Not to my knowledge. How odd. I almost feel as though we have. I'm sure I would have remembered. Yes, quite. The Wild Hunt. Big Finish. We love stories. At the end of every Big Finish story, we hear the name Jason Hay Gallery, executive producer. Aside from running and owning Big Finish Productions, Jason is a well-established producer of theatre, audio and film. We look forward to hearing the story behind and the future of Big Finish. So welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you. Listen, do you want to just tell us a bit about who you are? Well, where are you at the moment and how are you going? Uh, I'm in... Uh, I'm on Wentworth Golf Course, would you believe, at the moment. Um, it's a very, very long story, but basically my house was flooded in January um, and we still haven't moved back in because um, they've had to remove all the floors and go down to the foundations. Um, so basically I'm living in a rented accommodation on a golf course. So, <laughs> so all the flooding we saw in January, that affected you and your house? Yeah, yeah, we were completely flooded, yeah. Uh, I woke up at 3.30 in the morning uh, when the alarm went off, uh, and the alarm went off because I had some extension cords on the floor, they got waterlogged, shorted the circuit, flipped the switch, the alarm went off because the electricity was cut to it, and I thought, what's that dog done now? Walked to the top of the stairs, looked down into the well of the hall, and the dog was paddling around in water, looking up, going, what's going on? What's going on? So... Um, <laughs> I, I did have a go at her, actually, because uh, normally she barks constantly if anything happens, like a bird tweeting outside. <laughs> um, but uh, didn't think to mention when we were flooded. But there we go. <laughs> yeah, dogs are like that. Now, can you tell us a bit about your past, your, your love of Doctor Who? 
Well, I've loved Doctor Who since I can remember. Um, I actually worked out with uh, Gary Russell that the first episode of Doctor Who I watched um, was uh, the, sea, um, the Sea Devils. I do vividly, vividly remember John Pertwee being um, being uh, captured and and um, chained up, as it were. I loved the program from the moment I saw it, and I I also vividly remember when John Pertwee turned into Tom Baker, and being very confused and very worried that my hero had turned into this. Um, goggle-eyed, bushy-haired madman, basically, as he was in the first episode of Robot. But uh, very, very quickly, we were playing Doctor Who in the playground, um, where I used to play Harry Sullivan. I've been a fan of Doctor Who since I can remember. Um, and potentially, my, my favourite eras were actually the Davison era, because I like the dynamic with the companions. Um, and... More recently, uh, I would say the the last season of Capaldi, I really loved. I loved yep. the storytelling. I loved the composition of the stories. I loved the interaction with Bill. I thought she was a great companion for him. So when you were young, did you get involved much with fandom in England? What, what were your connections? Well, yeah, uh, I sort of did fandom on my own, practically, because um, I did have some friends who were into Doctor Who, but I was quite obsessed by it. And um, I decided that I would start uh, a fan magazine myself, just for myself. And uh, and I thought I would sell about 20 copies to people I knew. And my dad would take it off to be photocopied. But uh, there was an article in Doctor Who magazine about fanzines, which I avidly read, obviously, because I was interested in this sort of thing when I was about 1415, they reviewed a number of fan magazines, one of which was Sharda, which was written, uh, which was edited by uh, Gary Russell. And at the end of the piece, there were, there were addresses to write to to get the fan magazines. And that's when I discovered that Gary Russell actually lives about 300 yards away from me, which changed my life completely that day on discovering that. Because being um, the precocious kid I was, I decided I would walk round and knock on the door and uh, talk to him about fan scenes. Um, Gary turned out to be five or six years older than me, uh, was working at the BBC at the time, and wasn't home. His mum was there. He was actually splitting his time between London and, um, and being at home. And he was back on the Saturday. So his mum said, come back Saturday morning. He'll be around then. So I came back on the Saturday morning, knocked on the door. He was primed that I was there to talk about fanzines. And we started a friendship, which 37 years later still continues. Yeah, he's been uh, a great friend to me. We still work together, obviously. He employed me as a very bad actor on uh, for audio visuals. Um, I, it then came back to me when he had the idea to do audio dramas of Doctor Who and said, how do we do this? By that point, I'd been to university, come out, started um, uh, a company and um, was developing uh, two businesses at the time. And um, I said, that sounds like a fantastic thing to do. Why don't we do it as a hobby? a nice fun thing to do on the side. And uh, Gary and I went in to see the BBC and we pitched them to do six productions a year for three years. They gave us a three year license. And after the second one came back out, I went back to Gary. Bear in mind, Gary was the only employee and he was doing it part time. And now I believe we have 63 people working at Big Finish. And when you count writers, directors, there's hundreds of people working at Big Finish, really. Regular actors as well. So it was very, very humble beginnings and very... I never intended to be what it is today. And maybe some of the best companies grow organically from something very small that um, was done out of love. You know, if you look at Apple, for example, that was started in 
in uh, Jobs, I think it was uh, Steve Jobs' garage with three guys from MIT, I believe, just enjoying computers and trying to make one of their own to sell. And we were pretty much the same. We were having fun doing the productions. But that's when my business brain kicked in a little bit. And after the sales of the first one were massive, then the second one came out and they were, again, massive, far more than we expected. I said to Gary, we're going to have to produce one a month and we're going to have to bring in more people to help us. And that's where we started. And we grew from, you know, three productions in the first calendar year to 12, 24, 36, 50. And I think we peaked in 2019 on 322 productions, um, which is a phenomenal undertaking. That's amazing. So where, where did... I mean, where did the name Big Finish start from? Because the Big Finish wasn't supposed to originally be an audio company, is that right? No, it wasn't. Um, it was a production company. I'd set up a production company to do long, long, long time ago. Um, Paul Cornell and I uh, uh, had pitched a series to um, Sci-Fi Channel Europe called uh, Phoenix Ryan, which at some point we should do something on whether it's audio or whatever, just to celebrate the fact that, that it exists. And we went into development hell for two years. So we pitched the series. Um, everyone went, this is amazing. Let's do it. Great. We've got a green light to go and do a series. Let's write the script. Brilliant. Here's the script. Fantastic. We've just been taken over by a, a company. I think it was CBS. Great. We need to just get this ratified. Great. And then two years later, we've just been taken over by Warner Brothers. Oh, okay. And we just got, Sci-Fi Channel Europe just got passed around. And one moment they had this much money and one moment they had this much money. And at one point they came back to us and said, we need you to rewrite the script so that you can spend $2 million extra. And it was like, right, okay. And at that point, Paul had rewritten the script so many times. I took it upon myself to just write it, rewrite it myself with one thing to spend the money, which was just put in massive action sequences to just spend the money. No change to the script, no change to the dialogue, just where there was small little things happening. It's like, right, instead of this happening, we're now going to build um, a massive great big set and we'll do a James Bond invade the lair moment, if you see what I mean. And yeah, um, yeah so we did, we did that. So I had a production company. And by this time, I'd met uh, Stephen Moffat, and uh, we met at one of Paul Cornell's parties. And uh, I was a massive fan of Stephen at university because one of my favorite shows was Press Gang, um, which was a fantastic show. If you've never seen Press Gang, go and have a look at it. It's on BritBox. It is brilliant writing in it. You can see the, the, the Stephen-ness of it from day one. I, this was around about 94, I suppose. Um, so I was about 26 and Stephen's about five years older than me. And he just started writing comedy. I mean, arguably he was always writing comedy, but he'd just gone seriously into comedy writing, uh, was writing for BBC Two, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just in awe of meeting Stephen because I went, this is amazing writing uh, for Press Gang. It's a kid series, but you wouldn't believe how brilliant it is. One drunken night, as it were, I said to him, I'm going to name my production company after an episode of Press Gang. And he was like, oh, right, okay. But, uh, but so got the production company for, because um, Sci-Fi Channel Europe told me, we need a production company to do the uh, production through. Fair enough. So I started one. And... Um, went through a number of different titles. Uh, the first episode of Press Gang is called Page One. And I thought, uh, Page One Productions. Uh, I went to company's house to register it and someone already had it. It was an obvious one to do. So then I went through other titles. There are crocodiles. I thought it was a bit oblique and whatever. Could be quite cool. And then I settled on Rock Solid. I thought Rock Solid Productions. And uh, I had an in-house designer who worked for my other company. 
and I said, get me a logo for Rock Solid Productions. And when it came back, I looked at it and thought, that just looks like we've been porn. And um, so the next episode after Rock Solid was The Big Finish. And I thought, Big Finish, that's uh, very sweeping. It's quite theatrical. That sounds like a good thing. Although there's arguably uh, Big Finish sounds like we do porn anyway. But um, the... Uh, yeah, so it ended up being Big Finish. Uh, we had to very quickly do the logo, and I just did the logo, which is ironic. I mean, it's it's on everything around here. Hold on, what have we got here? Um, so I've got an eighth, uh, an eighth Doctor and Dalek Interrogator Prime here. And as you can see on there, we've got the Big Finish logo there. That logo was designed by me on Word in three minutes because they were like, we need a logo. And I was like, oh, ah, just did it. Um, which is why it's not the greatest piece of design in history, um, but it's, it's served us for 23 years. You, you've, um, never, you've never thought about redoing the logo, getting re new graphic artists to come in? Uh, well, funny enough, we've, we've had other graphic artists do it, but they, they like, I, I actually hit upon something thematically, which is the big is big, and the finish is small, and it creates a box. And for CD manufacturing and everything like that, it's perfect size and shape. So by fluke, I actually did something which was correct from a design ethic point of view. And what we've done is change the typeface um, and change the color scheme and stuff like that. But actually, every creative artist who's come to it said, no, this is really good. What we need to do is just change that and change that, but it's remained the same logo. So there we go. So if someone asked you, what do you do? I mean, what, what part of your life is Big Finish and what part of your life is what else you do? What else, what else you do with your life? I have uh, now, I'm either the majority shareholder in, the owner of, or the minority shareholder in 16 companies. Um, so I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor um, and they range across the board so I share my time between different things I used to um, the, the firm I had with my late father was called CFP which is a, a leading uh, charity and not for profit consultancy firm and we've I've, I've worked with clients from um, the Labour Party through to Manchester United that's takes up a reasonable amount of time. I'm now the chairman only there. I don't deal with clients direct because everything else has taken up so much time. Uh, Big Finish I spend a lot of time on because it's expanded, because it's not just Big Finish, it's Big Finish Entertainment, Big Finish Theatre, Big Finish um, something else, which we're about to launch. Um, and uh, Big Finish Creative as well. Um, Big Finish Creative does animation and is about to announce another TV show that we've just filmed. Um, Big Finish Entertainment does a lot of interesting projects, including films. Um, and uh, Big Finish Theatre has done 27 touring shows and 14 West End shows. Um, so that does take up quite a bit of my time. And in fact, one of the things I did was, um, you, uh, you buy into about five years ago, I bought into a general management company for theatre called DLAP and helped to, um, expand them and I'm non-executive chairman there. Um, and that, uh, has led to me becoming part of the DLAP group. And uh, and there I'm I'm a minority shareholder, but I basically chair the group, as it were, um, and help them move forward with their businesses. Um, some very exciting stuff happening as well. Um, we've got a lot of projects on the go, but uh, I suppose our biggest hit at the moment is Rock of Ages, which is a great fun '80s musical, which uh, begins touring again very soon. Um, but there's there's a couple of things I can't tell you about because there's always something new happening because a lot of people know I have an open door um, and they they come to me. So funny enough, Paul Cornell and I are hatching a new scheme. Um, some 
20 odd years later, nearly, well, 20, 27 years after we originally worked together trying to get Phoenix Ryan happening, we've, we've got another scheme, which is amazing. Yeah, so it does vary what I'm doing. On a lot of the Big Finish extras, um, mm. I hear David Richardson, who comes across to me as the ideas man, uh, have a great idea. And he, he often says, well, we took it to Jason and Jason gave us the okay for the idea. So mm. what kind of things as the business guy behind Big Finish, what, what are you considering when someone comes to you with an idea? I have to be a bit hard nosed about it in that, you know, it has to make commercial sense. So um, with the Doctor Who line, it's often a spin off. So it's a question of, is it a spin off too far? And we have a production report which has the dates in which everything's going out. And we've got it for the next few years. So we, we actually have some productions which are for 2029 already completed. Um, and we, we have a lot of stuff for the anniversary year completed. This is a practical thing as well. At the top of the production report is a load of ideas which we haven't scheduled and we haven't progressed enough yet. Um, one of those, for example, for years was Lucy Miller. Um, the new box set we did with the new adventures of Lucy Miller, which we did with Paul McGann and Jerry Smith, which came out um, God, with the pandemic, it's a couple of years ago now. Mm. Um, but it was because Sheridan always wants to come back. It wasn't, she left, she didn't leave because she didn't want to do it anymore. She left because... Um, Her career was so big. We, we killed off the character because she was impossible to get hold of because she became uh, incredibly successful. And when I say incredibly successful, I mean ridiculously successful. I mean, she was winning BAFTA, she was winning Olivier's, she was just constantly in demand. And we were literally to get um, the last season of uh, the Paul McGann single CDs done. Um, we were putting Sheridan on a courier bike and courier from set when she had a break to the studios to record, getting her back onto the bike to go back to set to film. And it was like, we can't keep doing this because we were just, it was just impossible. Um, we love Sheridan, absolutely adore her. And Nick and I actually sat her down and explained that we love you and we adore you, but it's just trying to get hold of you is a nightmare. And we, we had a schedule to keep. So we thought it was best to kill off the character. Um, something that we hated. In fact, one of the reasons we did Mary Shelley straight after that uh, was because um, we couldn't face continuing the story. Having been killed off Sheridan, we needed a piece of a period of time before we rebooted the Eighth Doctor again, which led to archives. And that was a very, very sensible decision um, to go off and do something completely different out of the timeline and then come back to the consequences of Lucy Miller's death. And led to us doing that right so it was absolutely the correct decision um but anyway as i was saying we have stuff at the top which we will go through and we would evaluate it on is this the right time to do it is it financially viable is it sensible to do is it going too far and there has been a few things which we've come up with where we've gone are we just going too far now we're just enjoying ourselves too much is it do fans really want to listen to this character doing this adventure so there has been um, a number of things which we did because we loved to do it and it was viable so for example lady christina um was one thing that david desperately wanted to do and i was like yeah let's do it because i reckon we can make it work and we have done but often we get asked by fans whose favorite character is something let's do chronicles of a character and you look at it from the point of view of the practicalities of the production against how many sales you're going to get and sometimes you have to go it's just not going to work so there is an element of that but david comes up with a lot of ideas funny enough he emailed me yesterday about something and uh, what what i also do is add to it 
So I went, yes, but, bum, 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 and actually said, we can do this as 18 releases over a period of time from this date to this date. And, and he went, ah, yes, but there's a problem with that because, bum, bum, bum. So we're still discussing that. So David does come up with a lot of ideas. I come up with some ideas, not as many as the other guys. And Nick comes up with a lot of ideas as well. And then our directors and producers come up with ideas. So uh, Scott Hancock has come up with so many ideas over the years. Um, and we're about to do, um, hopefully, uh, sign two big name actors to come and do a new series for us, which Scott and James Goss have come up with. Um, naming, no names. Um, but it's, it is always uh, an open door. I've always had an open door. And people can come in with an idea and just ask me, do you fancy doing this? So how much are you involved with the day-to-day running of Big Finish? Are you, are you touching base every day? Yes. Yeah. Um, I probably... I get in um, on a good day about 200 emails, on a bad day about 400 emails. And I would say that uh, probably between 50 and 100 emails a day to big finish. So it's probably about a quarter time, which is surprising, but it is actually one of the most fun things I do. You'd always look at what is financially workable, which you have to do as a part of a business. What what is mm. what have you what have you produced which you weren't sure would be successful, but this has been a huge hit, and vice versa. What what do you think this is going to be successful, but actually wasn't? Has that happened at all? Yeah, yeah, it has happened. Um, I'll do the the last one first. Um, we thought the the Doctor Who comics adaptations would be more successful than they were, and I think maybe we I don't know maybe we missed the boat slightly. Um, I grew up with those comic uh, strips in 79, 80, um, with Sharon and and uh, Tom. And I was pretty sure that it was a bit of a slam dunk, that a lot of people would come up by them. They, it didn't really take off the way we hoped. Um, and on the other side, pleasantly surprised, um, in a non dot Who way, um, one of our biggest hits in the last couple of years is Space 1999. Okay. Which I thought would be quite successful because it has a good fan base, but was more successful than we expected. From a dot Who point of view, I would say, you see, the spin-offs like Missy, we thought, thought would do really well, and it did. Um, and the Master stuff, Masterful. I thought Masterful would be here, and it was there basically, in terms of success. Um, that was very, very successful. Um, it was no shock that Chris Eccleston has done incredibly well. It was no shock that David Tennant did incredibly well. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Tenth Doctor Adventures, Dalek Universe 3. There's a planet down there. Where did that come from? Doctor, look out! I'm a velon. I'm a velon. Oh, I figured... You can graft Mavellan flexors to human extensor tendons. I look younger than I am. Well, so do I, but still. <laughs> this is pointless, Cayman. Stop. On your knees. On your knees, Doctor. <laughs> River! Stop. I know that name. And I know exactly what's in this cell. Or rather, who? It's Davros. Look, that Mavellan rocket's at least twice the size of the others. Rumors are true. That's the Mavellan Prime ship. How do my Daleks fare against the Movellans? You must tell me! Still the same old Davros. Anger issues and a very low patience threshold. Ah, got it! Uh, uh, We're free! Uh, uh, Kemble. Yeah, sorry, I didn't like to say. We've not had the best of luck on this planet. You will infiltrate the first Movellans vessel and provide a diversion to enable our attack. These machines would not leave themselves vulnerable to so simple a tool. Oh, you never know. I've upgraded. A lot. You are the Doctor. Are you the boss? I am the Kemble Faction Analyst. Through the vent, up to the main power chamber, sabotage it and pfft, ship full of Mavellans doing the deactivation disco. It's a sound enough plan. Pity you're giving it to the Daleks. I saw my world, my people, destroyed. That is still nothing. 
what has happened in the years that have passed for you. Never you mind. What are you throwing at me now? Big finish. We love stories. There's things that you do where you think this is almost impossible not to be successful. And then there's other things which are a bit more of a punt. Like I said, maybe Christina was a bit of a punt. She was in one episode. We liked the character. We liked Michelle. We'd worked with Michelle. And we were like, well, let's just bring her back and do some stories. And um, Russell was okay with us doing that. Um, because we, we, when we bring back Russell's characters, we do need his permission because he owns those characters. Some of those type of things is a bit more of a punt. And, uh, and you are pleasantly surprised when they're successful. One of the things I don't know whether you release, do you ever release in terms of what, how many things sell? Because I mean, I, this is probably just me liking, loving this in terms of, you know, <laughs> what, what, what would we expect to see in terms of sales figures? And I'm just, just wondering, you know, what really sells well, but also how much too are you still fighting the whole pirating side of things? Uh, we uh, contractually don't release sales figures because it's not something the BBC likes talking about. Um, but obviously they're successful enough for us to do what we're doing. Piracy is still a big issue. Uh, I remember Alan Barnes once uh, going to a pirating site and looking at how many sales there were. And um, with after about half an hour, he said he quit because he realized that if he was receiving his back end percentage on the downloads, which were illegally done, he would have paid off his mortgage. Um, we, um, we sent a guy to count illegal downloads once on one of the sites and they were in the millions. So it is an issue, piracy, because um, they, uh, by not giving the money to Big Finish, even small amounts of money, it does uh, lead to us you know, we've always been at risk of not producing. And we had um, we had a period of time when the TV series was so successful that Doctor Who fans sort of drifted away from Big Finish. And um, it, uh, it led to us almost going under. And that was the first year of uh, Matt Smith. So I'm not blaming Stephen at all, and I'm not in any way. Um, I think it was momentum. You'd had those brilliant, you had the great launch, you had the brilliant Debbie Tennant's years, and then Matt Smith. And it just had got to the point where for 13 weeks a year, uh, Doctor Who fans were avidly watching Doctor Who, and their attention span on, Blake, on, on um, Big Finish had gone down. And we used to see sales would literally fall off a cliff and then scrape back up after Doctor Who finished. So we had the situation where we would schedule stuff on the basis of we need to make a big impact once the series finishes. And we would do things which were along the lines of, um, if you're missing Doctor Who, we're still here, is basically the, what we were pushing through our marketing. And... I think one of the things that massively changed for us, though, was the 60th anniversary. The, uh, sorry, the 50th anniversary. So I'm thinking about the 60th. Yeah. The 50th Good. anniversary. Um, when, I mean, we were we were bubbling along and we were just about getting by. And then the 50th came along and suddenly the BBC was far more open to promoting other doctors and, um, and the fact they existed. And Stephen wrote the companion's names into Night of the Doctor, which was amazing. Um, and we knew that was happening because Stephen had actually phoned us and said, can I just double check the companion names and how you spell them? Uh, and so he, would, uh, so he put all the, all the names in um, deliberately to um, bring the world of Doctor Who closer. And because McGann's Doctor is an audio doctor, really, you've had Night of the Doctor and you've had um, the TV movie. And if you add the two times together, I think it comes to 51 minutes he's on screen in total. Um, and look at the hundreds of hours we've got with him as the eighth doctor on audio. 
So he is sort of the audio doctor. Yeah, there was a time when we were suffering a little bit, but the anniversary made a lot of New Who fans go, oh, and there's a lot of other stuff that you should really check out. And that led to them buying old DVDs and uh, looking at other doctors and then discovering that Big Finish had Colin Baker, for example. They'd watched them on DVD and gone, do you know what? I really want to see, listen to Colin Baker. So they went off and bought Colin's productions. And then since then, we've, we've grown and grown. It's been fantastic. Uh, a few days ago, I threw out a tweet uh, on our social media asking our followers what they would like us to review. And I was surprised mm. that uh, of the love that Rangers like Sapphire and Steel and particularly the Tomorrow People still have yeah. among fans after so long. But obviously, you don't have the, the rights to that uh, at the moment. But is there any chance that anything from the vaults might one day get out there? Is that a chance or is that just... Well, this, is the, this is the thing I have brought up with the production companies who own the rights in the first place, which is that all of this stuff is still available to legally download and no one's getting any money, which doesn't make any sense. Um, but the the Tomorrow People license wasn't renewed because they were making the series in Canada, um, right. which ran for one season. And then and I have gone back and discussed it. And it is rather complicated at the moment, as these things sometimes are. Um, I suspect, you know, they had an option to uh, do another series or renew it within a certain period of time. They've got to wait for that option to run out. But, um, and with Saffron Steel, they were trying to reboot it for television, which comes as no big surprise. It's a perfect, you know, it's a great series and it should be rebooted for television. But, uh, you know, we'd love to get those back. Um, because actually, especially Saffron Steel, uh, you know, the performances from uh, David Warner and Susie Harker are amazing. Mm. Um, and then with the Tomorrow People, it's just harked back to what I grew up with. And the Tomorrow People, I love those stories. And, we've, and the cast are still there. You know, um, we've still got them around. We could still do more stories. You know, we, I love doing the Tomorrow People. I directed a lot of the episodes. Um, and it was great fun to do, and I would love to do it again. Big, Big Finish introduced me to shows I didn't really know before, so mm. what your clever marketing campaign, you put out a free episode, the first episode of Survivors, which <laughs> yes. I, li I, listened, I listened to and then bought, you know, I don't know, more than a dozen, or, yeah, dozens and dozens of stories after that. Thanks a lot. Um, and, then, and then you ended it, but now you're bringing something like that back. So what, what made the decision in terms of, you know, it, it felt like you'd cancelled it. I'm not sure if you had or not, but now you've made it. I sort of think we rested it. And I, I, again, I'm coming back to that production um, uh, report and those titles at the top. Um, we needed some space in production to do other things. And Survivors is not our biggest selling series. It's a great series, but it's not our biggest selling. And... We'd done a whole story arc and it had come to a natural conclusion. So it meant we had to start a new story arc. And, you know, we just sat down there and, and we're looking at, you know, we need the production time and the producers to do this, to do this, to do this. And it felt like maybe it was a good idea to give it a rest and give people also time to catch up because there was an awful lot of people who bought a few of the series and then were catching up because the problem is we have the... Um, the sparkling, uh, the the aspect of bringing out new sparkly things and going, oh, this is all exciting and new. Bring out Masterful, and and everyone goes, oh, Masterful, must buy that. And then, of course, they were planning to buy season ten of um, Survivors that month, but now they've bought Masterful instead. You know that that happens a lot, and because um, we know that people don't have infinite supplies of money, understandably. So we are sort of competing with ourselves a little bit. So I'm very conscious of that. And sometimes it's good to give a break so that people can catch up. Uh, and Survivors was on those series, which we thought we'll just give it a bit of a break. And that break ended up being about three years, I think. And now we've gone back to it again. Um, because it's fundamentally a brilliant series. Uh, I always say it's Walking Dead without the zombies. Um, so it's the best bits of Walking Dead. So I think it's it's a great series. And 
it's developed into a very unique series. And a lot of the actors involved now are very, very um, involved with the creative side as well, like Louise Jameson. Yeah, it's, it's just a great series. So we're very happy to bring it back. In the last couple of years, you've been making a big effort, and it's been obvious in terms of employing more women as directors, producers, writers. Um, yeah. your, your casts are diversifying a lot more too. Um, how much, how deliberate has that been? I'm sure it's been deliberate, but in terms of how, you, why the changes of recognizing the need for that, and how are you feeling that's going? Well, I think with it wasn't so much as a. a a conscious decision is more of a development. It just sort of naturally happened. And I think when, you've got to remember again, when we were a hobby, we were just employing our friends. And um, we then started to branch out and work with other people who had other friends. And slowly but surely, we these things changed the more female directors and producers has just come along naturally. Um, There are a lot more female audio producers available to us now than there were 20 years ago because more women are involved. Um, It's, uh, uh, and similarly, there are are a lot more uh, diverse actors available than there were Um, I've been doing some lecturing at a couple of drama schools in London and uh, I've seen the difference, the number of black and uh, Asian actors coming forward to drama school um, has increased, which gives you far more uh, actors to choose from. Obviously, it's a fantastic thing to get different voices and different, um, different views of the world and you reflect society better uh, because society is multicultural all around the world. So that has naturally happened. I don't think there was ever really an agenda to really push um, in this area. It just sort of happened. And then it was, uh, you know, when things like Black Lives Matter happened and so forth, we were already out there doing stuff, basically. I, I, I'm probably explaining myself badly, but it was an organic thing that happened over time. Um, and yeah, we've, um, we've had some fantastic, we've got uh, a new uh, producer who's just started with us, Dominic, who um, I had a meeting on Zoom with the other day, and he's got so many new ideas. It's gonna be a question of reining in. Um, we're going to have to keep control of him. He's probably listening to this now. But uh, he, uh, I'm looking forward to finding out what he's going to bring to the party. Because Big Finish is a party. Is there one thing you can, uh, one thing you can tell us to look, uh, that we can look forward to over the next, say, 12 months? Or is it all under NDA, strict NDA? <laughs> what can I talk about? It's so difficult. Um, I think we've we've got some really exciting new adventures in the new format for the for the doctors. Yeah, the as you know as you know we finished the um, the the monthly releases. Yeah, I'm very excited then, about particularly the what you're doing with the second doctor. I'm very keen to see how yeah. that how that turns out. Yeah. So, well, I think one of the things is by giving the doctors individual series which we will then um, promote and they'll have their own series rather than being part of a recurring monthly series. Um, We can make them stand out more. And also they'll have more discs. You know, uh, McGann has has had the advantage of more discs all the time to talk of, to build stories, and that's what they're going to get as well. So I think it's it's a positive move. any change is going to have people who say, oh, we don't like change, you know, but the essence of Doctor Who is change. That is the core of the program, you know, regeneration, and our monthly range has regenerated into something a bit different. Excellent. Um, but I will give you a teaser of something. We have a story coming up in the next few years 
which stars a big Australian star. Ooh, big Australian star. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm okay. not even going to tell you if it's a man or a woman. So, uh, but it's someone who really loves Doctor Who. And um, we, uh, we were contacted and during lockdown, because a lot of performers were sitting at home not doing very much. And it was like, this is going to be great. Let's just do this. So we basically had someone special playing something really good. Well, you did that with and Australian it, actors in the Lady Christina set, didn't you? So yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's one of the benefits that the pandemic has brought to, to your mm. business is being able to, yeah. to use these actors from all over the world. It's incredible. Absolutely. It's, it, there's been that. And re we're recording remotely now. Means, I mean, I was on, I was talking to a, a Hollywood agent last night at 10.30 at night about actors on the basis of, we only need them for this period of time and we can pay them this much. But if they're not doing anything, then why not take the gig? Because, funny enough, audio doesn't pay as well as film. It's a big shock. But, um, but if you're not doing anything, you don't have to learn the lines and it's acting and it's fun. So come and do it. So um, I love working with Eric Roberts. Um, he's been great fun to work with and he's a lovely man. Um, and uh, that's been done quite a lot. That's been done remotely. Well, all of it's been done remotely because he's in Los Angeles. Have you seen Eric Smithmakers by any chance? No, I haven't. No, I must do. It's hilarious. Why? It's hilarious. Oh, I know. I know. He's a very <laughs> funny guy. And uh, yeah, we've we've been able to reach out to a lot of people. And you know, potentially Chris Eccleston probably wouldn't have happened for another few years if it wasn't for the pandemic. I think that. I think he would have done it eventually, but this brought it to a head because, again, he was available to us. He was at home between jobs, and he'd, he'd obviously... Uh, what, what broke the ice? It wasn't Big Finch who broke the ice. What broke the ice was doing conventions. When he finally agreed to do conventions, and he felt the love out there because I think there was a certain part of him that was like, David and Matt came in straight after me and both were so successful. I think everyone forgot about me because I only did 13 episodes. And then he discovered that, no, he was loved. And um, I think that shook him a bit. I don't think he realised what level of impact he really has because he'd left all that behind. And coming back to the conventions, because I, I did say I, I was introduced to him at the Gallifrey Convention by Sean, uh, Lion, who, um, who runs the convention. And I said, look, we'd love you to come and work with Big Finish. And um, having talked to him for a few minutes, he said, make me an offer. It wasn't a yes, it was like, make me an offer. So I then talked to his agent and we put something together that worked for him, worked for us. And obviously that's been a massive success. Um, and everyone's loved having Chris back. And I've got to say, he was a bit like doing the process, I, I would describe as um, high diving, in that he was walking up the steps towards the high dive, walking along. But once he actually sprung off, he was 100% committed and loved every minute of it. So, but it was a little bit difficult getting him up the stairs in the first place. But it um, certainly comes through. Uh, in his performance, you can you can oh, really tell he's, he's loving it. He's absolutely adoring. He's he's remembered what he loved about Doctor Who, and for various reasons, there was a period of time when Doctor Who didn't really work for him, um, and his memories of Doctor Who were not as great as they should have been. Um, and I think it's just reminded him how much he loved the character and how much he loves playing the character. And again, coming back to this dive, going off the diving board thing. Um, he came and did, you know, when we talked about how many episodes, initially I said, come and do three, see how you feel. And he said, we're either doing a series like the television show, which is why we ended up doing 12. Um, we're either doing the series or we're not doing it at all, basically was his view, which is understandable. So, um, you know, that's why I went back and went, great, we've got 12, 12 stories to write. Let's get on with it.
Awesome. Um, it's been it's been uh, a highlight of last year during a period of time when all of us were in the UK were locked down three different times, and I know you guys are being locked down now. But you know, we the, the worst one was we basically were locked down from December through till May. So there's pretty much six months of not being able to go out, um, and you know, uh, being involved with all this and recording these and knowing they were coming um, was was something to massively look forward to and something which we all loved, and that's been exciting for us. Well, I'm, v- I'm very mindful of your time now, so I really appreciate you having a chat no with problem. us. Thank you, Jason. Okay, well, it's been delightful to talk to you, and uh, I hope uh, to see you again soon. I hope to see you in Australia at some point. Yes, hopefully you'll be out again soon when we let back in again. Thank you, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. No problem at all. See you later. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Ninth Doctor Adventures, Lost Warriors. Do you suppose it's safe to be out of doors? Safe now, I should think. They only seem to come out at night. The stranger stared at the sheriff. What? 1925? Come on, I can't be far out. Look at the state of you. Look at the state of us. 1925? Why do you keep saying that? I want to talk about your butler. Stratton. Something moves in the mist. Don't look at it. Hello, ladies. <gasps> No. I do beg your pardon. I am Queen Cluach. Oh, you're much more than that. You're Lady Macbeth. Tell this demon to leave her home. Curse that. Tell him to get out of here. Oh, well, we've attracted an audience. The pitchfork kind. I'm not afraid of you, blue man. I know what you bring, and I know your limits. Oh, I'm glad someone does. I'm the doctor. Doctor. Yeah, now, stand still, cos if that thing turns nasty, I don't want it to take your feet off. And lights. Roll camera. Actors, go. Look at it. The pinnacle of silent film. As opposed to what other sort? Your machine man. I need it. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Herr Lang, I promise you will not regret this. You're making Metropolis. (laughs) Of course. Everyone knows this. Fantastic. Fritz Lang. Actual Fritz Lang. I've got a knack. I'm good with lost things. I'm sure you are. Lovely and shiny. You will be like us. Good God. <laughs> Kill Fritz Lang. Big finish. We love stories. Well, Philip, uh, that was a fascinating chat with Jason. We we had to cut it a little bit short because he had another meeting. These businessmen, I don't know, always rushing around doing things. But uh, it was great to great to chat with the man behind uh, the company that we uh, have propped up so much with our wallets over the years, Philip. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I'm probably paying for his rent at the moment for the uh, golf clause he's staying for. But uh, do it, We do it happily because the stories are that good. I mean, that's why we do it. Yeah. What, what else do you work for except to pay for big finished stories? That's right, exactly. Uh, so that was really good. Hopefully we can uh, we can chat again with Jason down the track and get uh, some more dirt. Okay, so I think at this stage it's time for some recommendations. And guess what, Philip? It is your turn. It's my turn. Well, there you go. Um, I'm going to recommend two things based on our conversation we just had with Jason. Can't do that. Uh, well, bad luck. So okay. while... <laughs> what I'm going to recommend is just Survivors. Uh, we talked about that a, a bit with Jason just then. If you haven't listened to Survivors, get it. I didn't know the TV series. It was sort of in my head because it was Terry Nation, but I'd never watched it. And then just got obsessed with the box set. They put out a free episode, bought the first, first box set, and just listening to that, that series after series, it is magnificent. I think we talked a bit about Be Finish and Diversity. Survivors is one of those shows in which women started having a bigger role in terms of writing and directing. Louise Jamison got her, one of her, well, her first single writing gig was on Survivors, and she wrote an all-female cast, all-female show, warts and all. It's a really powerful episode. It's either box it up three or four. Oh, is that her, because that Doctor Who she wrote was with Nigel Fares? That's right. So Nigel Fares. So the she, Survivors one was just her. 
That was right. So that was her first, and that just Nigel Face gave her confidence and gave her a bit of a voice. But Survivors was actually she. That was her voice and matters things that mattered to her. And yeah, so but all of Survivors is like that. It just introduced amazing characters. It is the it is the Walking Dead without the zombies. It is unbelievably depressing. Like, don't get me wrong, you won't walk away feeling happy. But if you love strong emotional reactions, you'll get it. And the other series I'm just going to talk about too, which I know is one of your favourites, but I've started listening to, is The Tomorrow People. So they've, once again, they've been sitting there for a long time, not listened to, and I've started listening to them finally, and I'm loving them. So I don't, you can't really get them, but I'm just going to say... If you, can you can find second-hand copies you on can find eBay floating about. Yep, you're right, and I actually picked up a couple recently. Um, so they are around, worth getting, because it's an amazing series. That's really a lot of Helen Goldwyn. She's an amazing, amazing actress, amazing director. Just she just finished directing the um, latest series of Chris Eccleston's, and once again, amazing voices finding a voice with Big Finish. Now, what about you, Dwayne? What have you been listening to? What What do you recommending? Okay, I'm going to recommend a song. Oh, well, I can recommend the artist too, but there's one particular song that I want to recommend, and I'll put the link to it in the show notes. Show show notes. The show notes. Um, you can have a look at it on YouTube and it's by an artist called Toya Wilcox. Do you know Toya? I do not know Toya. Well, do you remember a documentary called, uh, more than 30 years in the TARDIS? I do. One of the interviewees in that documentary is Toya Wilcox. She's a musician. So she, she talks about having a fetish for the Cybermen in the silver wetsuits. That's Toya. And do you remember that? I would probably sound like I've tried to expunge it from my memory. That's the <laughs> scene. Um, so Toya Wilcox, uh, for for me, who's into music, she ended up marrying um, Robert Fripp, who is uh, the the founding member and the only consistent member from the '60s to now of uh, one of my favourite bands, King Crimson. So what they've what i've been watching of them is that they've been in lockdown in their house and every week they put out a different funny music video with toya doing something sometimes slightly risque uh but robert fripp uh and and her doing something funny she's released i think by the time this podcast goes out the album will be out but she's releasing a new album and she recently did a video for uh, a song that she wrote called zoom and it's all about living life during the pandemic and lockdown through through Zoom. And so the lyrics are very uh, poignant for our day. And it's a really, it's, Toya Wilcox is not usually the artist I would go for, but I just happen to be watching her channel because I laugh at her videos with Robert Fripp. He plays guitar on it. So it's great to see Robert Fripp playing guitar on this song. Toya Wilcox uh, with the song Zoom. Got a link for it in the show notes. Check it out. Um, I think uh, you'll like it. It's pretty groovy. You're okay. going to check it out, aren't you, Philip? Of course I am. I check out everything you recommend, Dwayne, with a passion. <laughs> I know you do. I know. All right, that's it for the Sirens of Audio for another week. I hope you all enjoyed it. We certainly did. We Thank did you very do. much for listening and for watching. Catch you next time. This has been the Sirens of Audio, Episode 76, Executive Decisions, with our special guest, Jason Haig Ellery, and your host, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Next time, we'll be reviewing two recent Doctor Who releases, The Eleven, starring Colin Baker and Mark Bonner, and The Lost Resort, featuring the fifth Doctor and team. To help us do that, we'll be joined by Big Finish Vortex magazine editor and producer of The Power of Three and Pieces of Eight podcasts, Kenny Smith. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Our email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Find links to all our socials and other info at sirensofaudio.com. And if you find yourself looking for a party, you'll find one place that's never affected by lockdown rules because, like Jason Hay Gallery just said, Big Finish is a party. And because audio drama... Rock! Rock! Rock!